Yes. Okay, so all of those are true. And so when someone said mostly everything, I teach a materials technology course on campus. And when we talk about history, we talk about the age of materials, right? And so when we start, we say, okay, we were in um, Iron Age, um, Bronze Age, and so forth. And at this time, I ask students what age you're in, and sometimes they'll say smart materials, and of course, because we use smartphones and, and um, computers and so forth, but we also can say we're in plastic age, like so much is made out of plastics. And so in the introduction, they talked about my research, we focus mostly on polymers, not necessarily plastics. So when I get to the heart uh, science part, I'll give you a little more information on polymers and how they're used for plastics. So yes, almost everything is made out of plastics. So before we go into detail of this topic, I want to take a second and discuss what is bioethics. So you see this definition up here, and I got it from this website, and it says it's a multidisciplinary study of and response to these moral and ethical questions. And then you see some more detail about, you know, diverse uh, fields of study, including life sciences, biotechnology, public health, medicine, public policy, law, philosophy, and theology. I highlighted moral and ethical questions. Why do you think I highlighted that? Or what does that come to mind when you think of those two words, moral and ethical? I think of guiding principles that we should consider in all of our decision making, whether it is good or bad for humans and the planet. I like that guiding principles. Anyone else? Maybe something that's slightly more subjective. More subjective. Anyone else? Questions whose answers are value driven. Answers are value driven. OK, let's stop just a second on those three concepts that are mentioned. Right. And so we say guiding principles. But when we say guiding principles, are all our guiding principles the same? No, but I do have some hope that we could actually come to a rational agreed upon ethics, but we'll see how that goes. Exactly. Agreed upon ethics. And from what you've learned in the last week and a half, nothing is perfect, right? And so it says in the chat also, whether our actions are humane or not, yes. And a lot of, and we'll discuss it a little bit um, with the, I guess, the people who drive these materials. When they talk about their ethics, are they doing it because there's a policy in place or they truly care about the environment? Okay, so I want you all to think about that. And also think about that, especially those that are in biochemistry or in engineering, when you start your career, what's gonna drive your passion? Will it be, will you consider the environment or will you consider what's the bottom line and the money that we're supposed to make in this particular industry, okay? Now, so where's the issue here when it comes to plastic and um, bioethics? So I actually started to put this into like a, a graph where you have the overlap in circles because you have the corporate social responsibility, which deals with the plastic waste generation and the disposal. And then you have the ecological and human health impacts, okay? And so you have health risk chemicals that are being used, recycling and aquatic life. But in actuality, all of those kind of overlap because we can't separate our corporate social responsibility from our ecological and human health impacts. Yes, they're driven by what the consumer needs, but are they taking into account the health risk and, uh, and the impacts um, into our environment? So I just wanna play this video here and please let me know if you can hear it should. Oh man, hold on. I wanted to make it larger than that. That may not be possible because I embedded it in the PowerPoint. Can everyone see it if I let it play small? Okay. Can you hear it too? If you'll double click on the YouTube icon, it'll take it to a new browser. Right screen. here? Yeah. Yep. Oh, but then I have to, let's see. We can see it, we can't hear it. Okay, so, give me one second. I think I have to. Share the YouTube. Can you see it now? Yeah. 
Can you hear it? No. No. See? Technology, I know. Who's gone? Maybe it's... Uh, you're supposed to be able to share audio also. You can Let move me... down to on your toolbar to more with the three dots. Yes. Share sound. Yeah. Okay. Or that course. Okay. You've probably heard about a giant trash island in the ocean. Or that poor sea turtle and the straw. Maybe you've even heard how plastic is being found inside the fish we eat. The plastic crisis gets a lot of attention, but the headlines usually focus on the plastic that ends up in the environment. And that's just part of the story. The truth is, plastic has a whole life cycle that's hidden from view. One that harms people and the planet from start to finish. Let's start at the beginning. Plastic is made from fossil fuels like oil or fracked natural gas. Extracting those fossil fuels and turning them into plastics creates a lot of pollution. Pollution that most often affects marginalized communities nearby. As we've gotten better about using less oil and gas to power our lives, the fossil fuel industry found a lifeline in plastics. In fact, oil and gas companies are doubling down on plastic production, with plans to build or expand over 300 petrochemical plants in the US alone by 2025. But these companies already produce more plastic than we can use. So where's all that plastic going? A lot of it's flowing into new markets in places like Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Because more than any other product category, plastic isn't driven by the demand for it, but by the supply. Corporations like Unilever, Nestle, and Procter & Gamble are aggressively marketing single-use plastic products around the world. These companies go to places like Indonesia, where I live, and push their products onto communities that just aren't prepared to deal with all that plastic. Maybe they're used to using natural packaging. Maybe they live on a tiny island without a system of waste collection. And on top of that, countries in the global north are shipping their own plastic waste into these countries too. When you add that all up, it's no wonder so much of this plastic ends up in the environment. And globally, that's where a whopping 32% of plastic packaging ends up. 40% goes to a landfill, where plastic just piles up for future generations to deal with. And 14% is incinerated. Incineration is a nasty business, producing toxic smoke and fly ash. <coughs> These super expensive facilities depend on plastic to burn everything else. It is oil and gas after all. So they want to see more plastic, not less. Yahoo! Then there's recycling. Unfortunately, it's not the solution that many people think it is. Just 14% of plastic packaging gets recycled and only 2% is effectively recycled, meaning it becomes something as useful as before. The rest is downcycled into something worse. And most recycled plastic is only recycled once before ending up in landfills, incinerators, or the environment anyway. So it turns out that we can't burn, bury, or recycle our way out of this problem. And we can't just scoop all that plastic out of the environment either. That's like trying to bail out a bathtub with a teaspoon while the tap is on full blast. So how about we turn off the tap by shutting down the plastic machine? That means passing policies that create systemic change. Like phasing out the single-use plastics that pollute the most. Ending the fossil fuel subsidies that are fueling big plastic. And holding companies responsible for the plastic waste they create. That's how we can achieve our vision of a zero waste future, where all of our products and packaging can be reused or repaired, effectively recycled or composted, and ultimately how we create a sustainable circular economy that works for both people and the planet. Visit storyofplastic.org to learn more Give me a second. I thought I had all this together, but of course now I've lost my PowerPoint. Oh, here we go.
isn't it? Okay. You've probably now. You've probably can two or three people give me their thoughts, their first thoughts from watching that video. What um, what struck you the most, like surprising you the most? Or did anything surprise you from that video? I think the most surprising thing for me was that like us recycling or I think that the responsibility mainly lies on corporations rather than the consumer. Like I always thought that me recycling would maybe make somewhat of a change, but it's more corporation based rather than consumer based. Thank you. Anyone else? The, the only thing that I slightly disagree with about that statement is that I think that we, while the individual, this is my perspective, while the individual action can lack power, I think we don't also see how consumer driven change has to happen in our own fundamental change of ethics. If we're demanding as consumers ease of use and disposability and what we want when we want it, we don't maybe realize we're driving these markets. So yes to policy change and yes to grassroots ethical extension as well, I think. Thank you, Dana. Anyone else? One more person. It was definitely overwhelming. <laughs> I feel okay. like um, I wasn't aware that we were dumping our waste to like other countries and places like that's just horrible. <laughs> I agree with that. That is overwhelming and surprising. I actually have a, another video that's that's going to sh that I'll share with you that's going to shed a little more light on that how ridiculous it really is and how it has become overwhelming for other countries. Um, Two things that I want to point out that you all hear the term doubling down from the industry. What does that mean? What do you think it means? Did anyone catch that? I see from something what, in the chat. Go ahead. Yeah, from what I understood, it was that um, even though like the uh, use of fossil fuels for energy was going down. So industries have been investing in fossil fuels to make more plastics. Exactly. So we hear about fossil fuels and the oil industry, but these companies are depending on our use and demand of plastic so they could turn that up. Is that surprising? Not especially. Not especially, okay? The other question is, so they list a couple of companies, Procter & Gamble and Nestle are just two that I'm gonna point out. When we hear those companies that we somewhat like or support, does it change our point of view on what they should be held accountable to? Does that make sense? Like since we like them, we like their products, should they be let off the hook when it comes to the amount of plastic um, generation that, you know, that they have? What do you think? Absolutely not. Anyone else? I feel like a lot of the customers will like care and want it to be better, but especially in companies that are like well known and well liked, there is always going to be some level of support. Yes, regardless of it. Exactly. Yep. And someone put that in the chat too. No, but it will be hard to get people to agree with that. No, but our initial reactions may not be holding them as account. That's true. Because it's almost like a friend, right? We kind of let them off the hook because we they produce a lot. We have people that, you know, we have colleagues or friends that work at those companies. So it's like, maybe it's not as bad as it seems. So we let them off the hook. The last thing I want to ask about this video, it says, um, alleviate the problem, turn it off. Can we really turn it off? What do you think? Can we really turn this problem off? I, I personally don't think that we really can at this point. I think we've kind of dug ourselves into a hole where we're so reliant on these plastics and uh, almost everything is made of plastic at this point. So I think maybe we can decrease it, but there'll be no going back. Okay. And then someone somewhat supports that. 
in the chat, it says, I don't think it would be sustainable even if we tried. Hmm. Okay. Uh, now, I just want to add a little bit to that. Because you all know more than our generation, and we knew we know more than a generation before that before us, I hope it gets to that point. We may not see it, but hopefully because of the generations that are coming behind us, they're going to know even more that it will become more sustainable. Ethan, I think I, you had your hand up. Did you want to oh, say something? Yes. I Go just ahead. was going to answer your question um, that you asked a minute ago. Um, like one thing that I think of, I work in a, a biochem research lab and we use a lot of um, pipette tips, which are just plastic um, and just the whole framework all the materials that we use so many of them are plastic so to just turn it off all at once everything would just stop and I don't think that that would be feasible yes exactly okay and we'll come back to that a little bit more because I have another question for you later on about that so thank you for everyone who responded I love the chat I wish I could read them all I'm gonna have to have, come back to them but thank you uh, so in that video, and I just want to bring it back to your attention, but I think everybody caught it. Our plastics are essentially fossil fuels in solid form. So here you see this cylinder has ethylene, benzene, propylene. A lot of our plastics, our plastics are coming from those old industries. So I definitely want to stress that, okay? This is the basis for our plastics, okay? Now let's go into one of those ethical concerns. And so, um, because of some of my passion, because like you said earlier in the lecture, um, human um, thoughts, are we doing things that are humane? I want to point this one out just for a little bit. It says, are plastic baby bottles safe? Okay, so you have plastic baby bottles are convenient, cheap, and unbreakable. And so the FDA banned this chemical, bisphenol A, from plastic baby bottles and sippy cups in 2012. Okay. Unfortunately, though, BPA may not be the only concerning ingredient in plastic babyware. Okay. So they found that this, this chemical was an issue and they banned it. Okay. So here are some of the things to think about why plastic pollution is even worse than we think. Okay. So we have BPA is one of several bisphenols, which are chemicals um, used to harden plastics. Okay. They mimic the body's reproductive hormones that may affect fertility and the timing of puberty, okay? There's evidence that they may also increase body fat and affect the nervous and immune systems. And many plastic bottles and sippy cups are made with the plastic polypropylene, okay? So we we know where polypropylene come from. Now we know the history of it. And so you had this ban, but do you think BPA and bisphenols are used in other containers or food containers or other things that hold um, liquids that we consume. What do you think? I'm not sure on this, but I think this kind of plastic, I, I don't know if I'm right, but this kind of plastic is used to make like water bottles. Is that correct? Yes. And there's this, I actually, um, last semester or this semester, I had a human nutrition class where we talked about our plastic water bottles safe because people are saying that um, the chemicals that they put on the, on the plastic mess with our hormones and all that. And it can get cancerous and very like threatening for people who drink mm -hmm. water. So that's, that's what I, that's what I think. <laughs> okay. So if that's the case, and if they're used like in the lining of canned goods and so forth, so they're used in other places, and they ban them for baby bottles, why aren't they banned for other uses? Usage, I'm sorry. Why wouldn't they be banned for everything? Anyone? Maybe this is a case of um, where we um, maybe policymakers give certain industries a pass because um, they're more well liked or have a um, better public opinion or something. Right. So we give them a pass. We're thinking they're going to do the best, maybe lower the concentration. Right. And we also hope they're looking for alternative. All right. Different industries have different rules. Yes. 
anyone else. They assume the general public won't be affected, but babies will be more because they are more vulnerable. Everybody agree with that or some agree with that? Yes, I want to add something to this. So when this happened, and I'm sure, you know, when we do research um, and we develop a product or we're working on a different compound or chemical, it's not used immediately, right? So yes, this ban came in 2012, but I'm sure they knew of it ahead of time. And so there are other compounds and chemicals that these companies, researchers were developing, right? And they said, okay, I have this alternative. Well, when they put that alternative in these particular products, it's not known what their longer uh, long term effects will be. So we take into account that these companies that say, OK, we're going to switch to this particular compound that may be less harmful to the body, but we don't know what the long term effect is, unfortunately. And so until those studies are done, we kind of expect these companies to maintain a lower, lower level. Of course, we also expect certain agencies like EPA and FDA to step in and say, OK, this is your threshold and you have to stay under that. Unfortunately, it's not always checked. And so companies will, I guess, that fine line between if I if I can get up to 15%, do I do 14.5? Right. And so just like we've seen with pollution and so forth, we don't know if the 14.5 long term is going to affect more people or not have an effect. And so they allow those companies to kind of stay on that line. Okay. Any other comments before I move on? Okay, so let's touch on the alternatives and what they give for those parents that have babies, they suggest glass and stainless steel. But I put a question mark here because really it's not feasible for them to use glass all time, um, all the time. Um, there's some safe concerns for the baby as well as the parent if they drop the glass. Then another suggestion is avoid high temperatures. This is the same thing for us, just like your colleague mentioned about the water bottles. If we have those water bottles on high temperature, we can't avoid that sometimes. And so we know that there are going to be some leakage of the chemicals into the liquid that we're going to consume. It says store milk smartly. Of course, we all try to do that, but we make mistakes. It tells the parents don't shake and then balance the risk, which we understand there's a risk with everything that we consume, even the medicines that we consume. We know that there are going to be side effects. Um, there's a hand raise. That was me. Go ahead. I have one question because mm -hmm. I was reading one of the articles and there was a comment about how using these alternatives to plastic like glass and stainless steel also have their own carbon footprint. So what I'm wondering is like, how much better is using glass and steel compared to just using normal plastic in terms of like benefiting the environment? So you, um, you didn't jump ahead, but you had you jumped me forward with a question I was going to ask you all. So when it says glass and stainless steels, and just like your colleague says, it has its, um, I guess, disadvantages as, as well. Why do you think we did away with, you remember when the milk was delivered to the door with the glass? Why do you think we got away from that? Did the glass what? maybe break? Glass, so you have safety, what else? I would say because the plastic was cheaper. Plastic is cheaper, what else? Anyone else? A safety hazard, you know, breaking glass, you cut yourself and all that. Mm hmm Not temperature control. Anyone else? Somebody said cheaper again. I think it would be um, like labor costs. Like you don't have to pay someone to deliver it. It could just be get got at the store. Yes. And someone put that in the chat too. Cheaper to make and distribute. So yes, glass has some advantages, but also the disadvantages, the shipping and handling and the labor. Supply chain uh, trump by national ones. Yes, that is the issue. Okay. So yes, glass may be uh, safer when it comes to the I guess the holding of the particular material like milk or any other liquid, but then it has its disadvantages. Okay. Um, and so the other thing is we were discussing um, actually in a uh, faculty setting, someone said, okay, if I have this plastic bottle and they say recycle it, why can't I just give them this bottle and they reuse it? What do you think? Why can't they just take this bottle back and reuse it? Why do they have to melt it down, 
recycling and so forth, why they just can't reuse these like they did with the glass. Contamination, health concerns, yes, all of that. And we would have to ship this back to them and then they would have to sterilize it and start all over. So you still have the shipping costs, labor and so forth. What are gonna be the regulations when they receive these back? And what are going to be the disadvantages and advantages? So the original um, question, I think it was Hill, did I answer it somewhat? You were asking what are the advantages, disadvantages of the glass and stainless steel? Does that help? Yeah, that helps. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Now, um, also, uh, your colleague was asking about, I think he mentioned the other alternatives with um, the advantages. Later on in the lecture, we'll also talk about plant-based alternatives and what the disadvantages would be with using those, okay? Yes, there are economical issues as well. Okay, now, in that video, you saw someone, um, use an asthma pump and some other things. So to me in that, that first video, there was a trigger for me that there are health concerns that happen. And so this picture says, okay, the plastic, the pollution that we don't see, right? Um, one of the things also in that video, it says when they you have this pollution, you have the health risk, it affects the marginalized population, okay? And so I want you all to keep that in mind for the next few slides, okay? So why plastic pollution is even worse than you think, okay? So a lot of times, and I think they mentioned, uh, the presenter mentioned it yesterday, uh, we don't think about what happens to get our particular products or who's affected and so forth. Um, because we're not near plants, we may not think about the pollution that's caused and how those that are nearby uh, suffer with asthma and other health issues. So I want to point out these facts here. And yes, it's a wordy slide, but I think it's important. Important. 90% of plastics are made from a chemicals rooted in fuels. And we already know that, okay? Um, they're refined and distilled into usable chemical compounds such as ethylene and benzene. And then we've already pointed out that the oil industry, Exxon, says it hopes to grow 4% each year. And part of its scheme is to achieve the growth involves one word, plastics. Okay, now with plastics, it's a modern medical. We talked about it being cheap, being able to ship it, lightweight. You see all the different um, products that you can make out of plastic. We say plastics everywhere. You see masks. We know it's durable and so forth. But then we also know that it's accumulated. So we have 150 million tons of plastic waste are discarded annually. Okay, this says 9% of plastics are recycled. The video said 14%, but we know there's only a small percentage that's actually recycled. And we know that there's a percentage that's affecting our aquatic life. Now, this says the real impact, but really it's just one of the impacts. But it's concerning to me because it's affecting a community that someone has done like stories on and I provided one of the resources for it. But there are multiple stories like this, okay? So if you look at this map, um, it shows Louisiana and then it has this place, Laplace, near um, New Orleans. And it says a neoprene plant continues its toxic legacy. To me right now, to me, just that heading can be alarming because it says a toxic legacy. That means that it's been known for years and we don't know how many generations is actually affected, okay? So a study found that the emissions like chloroprene, benzene, toluene, xylene, and so forth in the air and in the urine of people who live near the nation's only neoprene plant in Laplace, Louisiana during 2021. According to the EPA, the risk of getting cancer in that area is 47 times higher than it would be in the rest of the country. Now, we just talked about if this is, okay, this was found out in 2021, a study, but we know that this plant has been there for years. And I'm sure this community has expressed dismay about the pollution. Why wouldn't there be 
more of a regulation of this particular plant. Okay, it's shown where it is and you see it's near a river, so it's near a water source. And then it's also showing some other pictures of how close it is to a school, church and daycare center. So let's look at this. The EPA opens a civil rights investigation to Louisiana's Cancer Alley. They've actually named this area in this community Cancer Alley. And I provide the, the link for you here as a uh, reference. There's multiple stories about this. And so you know there's an issue if they've named it Cancer Alley because of the number and the high risk of getting cancer in this area. The EPA probe has raised the hopes of residents in St. John, that's the, the Baptist parish in that area, if you're familiar with Louisiana, they call it parish, who have long questioned and high incidence of cancer among those living near a 53-year-old neoprene plant. So if it's been allowed to be there for 53 years and they know the effect. I just wanna give you all an opportunity to kinda let that sink in and do you have any questions and feedback or anything alarming or surprising about this? Someone said because they care more about profit than people. I'm sure race and class probably has something to do with their unheard voices. I'm sure. I agree with that. Anyone else? Nothing surprising? Alarming, but not surprising. Okay. Oops, did I change that? I'm sorry. Okay, well, let's keep going. Let's look at this. There's no other questions. The panel probably provides a lot of jobs to people in the area. That's true, um, but it's not an excuse. It reminds me of the situation of Flint, Michigan. Agree. Let's do another video. Let me see. Oh, not close. Let's talk about recycling a little bit. I'm good on time. Hold on. I try this again. Uh, st stop share. Let me make sure the link is open. Professor, I'm so sorry. I have some children home. I had to step away. Um, was that last issue you were discussing what's going on in Cross at Arkansas with the Coke Industries? Or was no. I, the last story I shared was in Louisiana. Oh, Louisiana. Well, wow. there's another Louisiana. terrible in Cross at Arkansas where very similar situation sounding going on. Really? Yes. Um, for this past spring, for the, um, it was a festival that was held through NWAC. Um, there was a documentary that we watched all about the Coke industries and Georgia Pacific. And very similarly, the whole town of Cross at Arkansas is polluted. They have cancer. They have tried to get the EPA to help. And it's been a really devastating situation that they have not really gotten any aid on. Um, so I didn't know that's very, you know, that's not that far from here. That's our state, very local. Exactly. So I started out that slide letting you all know that's just one example of multiple stories, right? That should be as someone said, alarming is not surprising, but should be alarming. And so there's things when it comes to policy, as well as we were talking about the consumer demand, what we can do, have a voice about that and change some things. So they change their policy and how they do, how they treat the communities surrounding these particular plants. Got it. Thank okay. you so much. Mm -hmm. And so if there are no more questions about that, we're gonna talk about recycling a little bit, okay? And I'm gonna share a video and I, sh there it is. And let me make sure the sound is shared.
Yep. It as Can you all a see it in here? Miraculously appears from nowhere and it goes to nowhere. It starts when the oil and the gas leave the wellhead and it keeps on being a problem at every stage along the way. Why is it that we're seeing so much more plastics entering the environment? This is the story of plastics. We got into recycling because we thought it was the right thing to do. Of course, it is a disposal service. Uh, you know, at its core, it's taking stuff that people don't want anymore and, and trying to do something better than landfill with it. In 2013, under significant pressure from our city council, um, we began accepting um, non-bottle mixed rigid plastic. So all the plastic containers, berry containers, keg cups, plastic cold cups, you know, from Starbucks. Procter & Gamble wants us all to believe that all their packaged goods are in, you know, totally environmentally sound packaging. You know, they want us all using single-use packaged products so that we're just, you know, on the supply chain. It's totally unfair to the cities and the recyclers on the back end because then everyone says, oh, it's recyclable, it's recycle-ready, you should collect it. Well, then what? The United States was shipping over 50% of its plastics and its papers to China. The situation was very similar in Europe. We were just shipping it all to China. China will deal with it. And we built up these big recycling programs and everything was about recycle. Recycle, recycle, recycle is, is the solution to everything because we had China there. So China's just said, you know what? We're sick of being a dumping ground and we don't want this stuff introduced into our country. I see the China thing as a, as a reckoning because it's all been this false market where we've just been shipping stuff to China. This is, in my 25 year career, this is the biggest recycling crisis globally that we have ever seen. At the same time, the tons are going up and up and up. The price is going down and down and down and down to the point where now it's costing us 50 bucks a ton to get rid of. If you think we're just gonna take it from China and ship it to Thailand or Indonesia or Vietnam, where is it going to go? When the government shut down the recycling center, most people shift to like more remote or hidden villages or other countries. From, from US. This is uh, Nestle? From UK? Yeah, it's from Australia. It's come from Toronto. Toronto. Dunking Donut. It's from Oregon. From yeah, New Zealand. Tivana. Ya, awalnya kita memang uh, merasa plastik ini sesuatu yang uh, bagus ya. Jadi ini praktis begitu. Kemudian orang, tapi kemudian terakhir kita bisa melihat bagaimana plastik itu berubah menjadi sebuah uh, bencana bagi kita karena Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Before I go back to the question on this slide, we had a question in the chat. Um, and yes, and that I agree, that is disturbing. It actually, it 
really bothered me towards the end when they were calling out the different countries on the labels of, you know, the waste that's basically been dumped in their area. Um, yes, it was disturbing to me as well. Um, so there's a question in the chat that says, um, how should we prior to or prioritize preventing one type of waste over another? For example, canvas totes may prevent plastic bag waste, but cost water. Metal straws prevent uses of plastic straws, but cost carbon. Paper versus plastic straws also come to mind. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. Of course, with um, my research, we focus with polymers. And so we're looking at using um, environmentally, environmentally friendly, and we call it green solvents to make membranes. And these are the membranes that are used for your water treatment. And so we wanna get away from toxic solvents. This is just one aspect. And we, you know, of course I chose to do that because of my focus or my research focus and what I think I'm capable of doing in my small circle was the most beneficial, like you said, you have one advantage and then you have a disadvantage. And it's the same thing that you all have been seeing like for the last week and a half, you may fix one issue for a certain population, then you have another issue. I'm not for certain what will be, um, what will be a priority for us. Um, I am gonna share with you some things that people are doing to use sustainable materials. And that may be an aspect um, that we can start with but I don't know if that's a priority for us. Does anyone want to add or comment on uh, Emily's question? Yes, okay, so there's another question that says, I'm not gonna read the first part, but it says um, the person knows that some of the alternatives listed in one of the readings are still much more expensive than the plastic equivalents. That's gonna be the case until um, the market for these products is higher and also until the demand is higher. Does that make sense? And so I'll give you some examples of that later on where they have done some cost analysis. And so, but that's long-term and then industry has to basically um, help the startup companies figure out how to upscale their process, right? So when they're a smaller company, they're only creating a small amount. And so you have these larger companies say Procter & Gamble, they say, okay, can I get that in bulk? but you have a small company, no, I can't supply that in bulk. And even if I did, who's gonna pay for you, for me to ship it to you? So then there's still some costs that um, need to be worked out. Professor, could I add a little thought that I'm having? Because a lot of the discussions that we have focus on what either very federal level policy change could happen or what like the one individual in all their, you know, needy circumstances can do. But I feel like we forget to talk about what communities can do. You know, even if, if I could just take the, the bag thing, I'm a seamstress. I could get together a whole group of seamstresses. We could sew bags and donate them to a local. Anyway, I just want to put in a plug that individuals, we don't have a ton of power, but if we rally, I think we could do more than we think. That was just a little two cents there. I appreciate the two cents and the plug, and I agree. And so as we get more people to think like you and come up with solutions, I think that I help. It also helps that we're having a discussion like this. So hopefully someone um, here today, um, it may be something new that they haven't thought of and they'll share it with someone in their community and they'll share it with someone else. Does that make sense? And so you kind of pass it along. Okay. Plastics are treated. Okay, now, so your colleagues have pointed out some things that we can do differently. And now I want to dive in that a little more, okay? So it's somewhat so surprising to some, not necessarily me because of my area, the amount of plastic waste that's generated by the beauty industry. This is cosmetic, um, basically 
everything we use, toiletry from, you know, laundry and so forth. So I've given you some examples here of how it can change. Hold on one second. I apologize. They're changing the lights in my building and they open my door. I apologize for that. Um, so one picture I have here is the butterfly. I don't know how many people use like uh, bath bombs. And so you can use that instead of like, you know, when I was growing up, you had the bubble bath, you had the plastic container. And so this would cut down. And then more recently, they have the larger detergent sheets that they're using or distributing. And so these are alternatives that we could possibly try using now. Someone put in the chat, there's also many opportunities to join an organization dedicated to helping your local community issues. If, one, if anyone is curious about some in Central Arkansas, I have a few organizations that I like a lot. So uh, communicate with your colleagues, network, and figure out some things that we can do as we continue this discussion, okay? The other thing that we can do differently are bio-based plastic are made of wide range of renewable bio-based feedstocks. And so this is what I'm going to go into detail a little bit more about. And so here you see um, on your left, um, agro-based feedstocks, there's your plants that are rich in carbohydrate, your corn and sugar cane, lignocellulosic feedstocks, plants that are not eligible for food food or feed production. This is key. When we talk about alternative, we don't want to compete with our food, right? We don't want to uh, compete with our crops. And so more researchers are looking at plants and so forth that are not eligible for food or feed production. Can we use those to make our products? And then of course you have your organic waste feedstocks. Now, so I don't know how many of you all play with Legos or still have Legos around, but there is a prediction that Legos will be made of 100% plant-based plastic by 2030. And so that's a good alternative for us. And so if we can get more products made out of plastic, the better. Then you see on your right, there's water bottles made from 100% um, plant materials in the Middle East. They've hit the market. But what do you think would be some drawbacks from the plant-based water bottles? Anyone? One or two people in the chat or take yourselves on mute. What do you think the drawbacks would be? Well, in order to grow the plants that are used for this plastic, you're going to have to have cleared land and area to do this. So that could exasperate the problem of uh, global warming and climate change because you're landscaping in order to grow the plants. Yes, that is a drawback. One of the things that they're doing with that, um, Cassidy, what I mentioned before, they're taking crops, say like weeds and um, wild grass that we don't necessarily use. So that's just there. And can we use that particular material instead? So that's what they're studying now so that you don't take up, um, you know, grow more of it. It's just kind of there. What can we do with it? Okay. Anyone else? My concern would be that rather than changing, rather than making a lifestyle change where we don't want to use so many disposable products, just switching to a different source to make those disposable products will, in the not so distant future, I think pose many of the issues we face now where a fundamental like lifestyle change seems like it would have more lasting consequences. Okay. All right. Anyone else on the drawbacks? So someone put in the chat, seaweed-based plastics can sometimes be weaker and not able to hold water. Yes, they can be weaker. That is a drawback. The shelf life is going to be shorter. That's a drawback. Another drawback that we have to consider, we've been drinking out of certain bottles and so forth. It's in a taste is going to be different that we have to be concerned with. Some people, someone said in the readings and mentioned that these types of plastics don't break down as well as we would think. That is true as well. Anyone else before I move on? Uh, um, could it affect like, well, for one, I think it could affect like brand loyalty and like customers that are used to using the same thing because they're not going to be, if there's changes being made, they might like not trust it as much because like changes, people don't like it. But also like, 
I, I don't know how the process works of making that type of plastic, but I'm assuming since it's, you know, something that's new that they haven't done before, I'm assuming it'll like affect prices somewhat and that, I, mean, I, I don't know how, if the process is more or less expensive than like the normal process of making plastic, but that could also affect prices. Josephine, that is a good point and you're thinking like an engineer. So what, how, how and why we're gonna change our process and what's gonna be the cost of changing that process, right? And now that we have this different material, we've been using plastic for so long, polypropylene and so forth, and now you want us to use this cellulose base, what machines are we, <laughs> what machines are we going to need to do that, yes. And so the next video, this is more of just fun and informative. So you can see how plastic bottles are made. And this is with, if I'm not mistaken, PET. So we're gonna move on. Oh, this was supposed to be not as hard for me, but give me a second. We're gonna, I'm gonna share this video. Oh. Plastic water bottles. They keep you quenched, but how are they made? Can you hear and see it? It all starts with thousands of tiny pellets, primarily comprised of Thanks. PET plastic. PET, or polyethylene terephthalate, is strong, safe, and makes up about 96% of plastic bottles and containers in the U.S. Most plastic products are created through a process known as injection molding, which begins with a technician loading the pellets into a giant funnel known as a hopper. However, these days, it's far more common for the pellets to be vacuumed up through tubes and directly into the hopper, where they are measured and portioned for the injection process. The plastic pellets travel down the hopper and into the machine where they are melted down and injected into molds in the shape of drinkware. For most drinkware, like plastic cups, the process is pretty much complete. A robotic arm removes the cups from the machine and stacks them for the technician to inspect. Lids and squeeze tops are also done in one. As the mold opens, the finished lids are ejected down a chute, ready for assembly. When bottles are injection molded, the process has multiple steps. Initially, the plastic is molded into a small, hollow cone. The cones are compact and thus easier to store. When an order is placed, the cones are inserted onto a conveyor and heated to make them soft and pliable again. Then they are squeezed into a larger mold while air is forced into the center, causing the plastic to expand to the full shape and size of the bottle. It's like blowing up a balloon. When they exit the mold, you have a fully formed and beautiful plastic bottle ready to hold your favorite beverage. Some machines are so enormous that the entire process is completed internally. The plastic is melted, the cones are formed, and then immediately molded into finished bottles without ever being touched by a technician. But we're not done yet, because injection molding is not the only way to make a bottle. This is extrusion molding, a process in which heated plastic is squirted out into long, hollow tubes like large plastic noodles. Three at a time, the molds clamp around the plastic noodles. Air is forced into the molds and the plastic tubes expand into the completed shape of the bottle. The bottles are formed, but there is extra plastic to be trimmed. So they are run through a cutter with a heated blade that shapes them up like a hot knife through butter. Now it's on to heat treatment. Without it, the ink used in screen print and pad print will not properly adhere to the drinkware. Our extrusion molded bottles are sent spiraling through a gauntlet of fire and out the other side ready for logos. Fun fact, an easy way to tell if a bottle has been heat treated is to dip it in water. If the water beads up, the bottle has not been treated. A fully treated bottle will come out of the water with a glossy sheen. Bottles and cups are great, but what really takes them to the next level is branding. So it's off to the screen printers to add your name and logo. The final step is packaging. The bottles are sealed in plastic, boxed up, and sent to lucky customers all over the world who are looking to expand their brand. There you have it, plastic water bottles, a great way to hydrate and promote your brand.
So what you just saw to kind of break up our talk in a little bit is a video describing um, making of the bottles using PET. And from what your colleague informed you is that switching to um, strictly plant-based is gonna change the entire process, which can be lengthy and expensive because you already have the process and it's set up there, right? And so now you actually have to transition to something totally different. And so to combat that, what um, some companies are doing, they're looking at how to do um, a percentage change. And what I mean by that is that maybe having a water bottle that's not 100% plant-based, but just 30% plant-based, right? Um, and so is there a difference in the bottle compared to the one made from the oil-based sources? And so they're doing studies on that. And just like you said in your reading, they're seeing that, you know, having 100 percent, you're still going to have issues. So can we take a small step to transitioning um, to a different way of making these bottles? And so how is this possible? So PET is made from ethylene glycol and terephthalate acid. And so there's two ways to make ethylene glycol, crude oil and corn. And so if we do more with corn, now we're transitioning to more of a plant based resource instead of using crude oil. And so that's what the industries are, again, they're doing, look at a, looking at, um, investigating and see how they can to transition to more of a renewable resource. This also kind of confirms what your colleague was saying about brand. And so if some of our trusted uh, companies would do this, then our consumers would probably trust it more because it's coming from a brand that they already use, right? And so a, a brand that traditionally used crude oil, now they're saying, hey, our bottles are 30% or 50% or later on even more, their base, their plant-based materials, hopefully that consumer will be more, in, you know, um, inclined to continue to use their products, even though they're now produced by renewable resources. Now, other thing that we can consider what can be done differently is policy. Um, I'm not into a lot of policy. I've read papers and provided some resources to you. So I am definitely open to discussion when it comes to policies. Um, as I said at the beginning, I feel like um, there's a fine line that industry kind of, you know, they have where their limit is and they reach that limit and they brought it to the extreme so that they keep their cost, um, basically their revenue to a certain amount, their profits. And so we know that policy needs to be changes changed as well, okay? Um, as you can see at the top, it says a longer time frame allows e evidence for primary research to complement existing knowledge, which is true. Um, we want that to be the case. We want to have more evidence on what's occurring. And then we want these companies to come up with solutions and ideas of how they're going to do that, okay? Um, interpret the results to inform policy options and make sure those that are making these policy changes that they listen to the evidence and use it. And so there has to be a two-way conversation. And as we mentioned before, these policy changes have to take into account the communities that they're affecting right? And what can they do to make sure that the consumer trusts what they're doing, their process of producing these products, as well as what's their process of changing their emissions and carbon footprint and so forth. So of course, a shorter time frame means that secondary research and evidence networks will be more cost effective. And so hopefully that will be taken into account when we have policy issues and what we should do differently. Are there any comments and questions on what you think is needed for policy changes, policy changes, I'm sorry. For these policy changes, like applying to corporations and such, like how could we, I guess, pressure them to become more sustainable or like what, what would they be willing to do to become more sustainable? And uh, I guess, how do I explain it? Sorry. I've just been thinking about this throughout it and I'm trying to figure out how to say it. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. I'll, I'll, while you're doing your thoughts and feel free to come back on, I think your colleague Dana mentioned before, it can start with the consumer. 
And if we demand them to do more, then hopefully they will, right? And if there are policies in place by EPA and so forth that says, hey, you can't, you can no longer use this particular compound. Like we're gonna give you a certain amount of time to come up with something else. Otherwise, we're gonna say no more. Then I think, I don't think that's an option now, but hopefully that'll be an option in the future. Um, someone put in the chat, it'll be difficult to be done. One area of struggle with it is ba uh, plastic waste in hospitals, yes there isn't a lot of accountability or incentive for hospital to use less plastic. That is true. That is true. So, and we said that earlier, I think somebody mentioned that different industries are going to have different policies, right? They're going to be different restrictions and limitations on how much they can change and what they can do with their process. Um, Ethan, you have your hand up. Yes. Um, just one thing that I've noticed is that often in these conversations, um, people will say that, um, you know, one option would be for companies to charge a premium on their products to pay for more sustainable packaging mm -hmm. um, and that they can position more sustainable packaging as a reason to, um, for consumers to pay more for their product, which I think is sometimes a viable um, strategy. But my concern with that is that it's not a viable strategy across the board because, I mean, not every product in the stores can all be chart like cost or can all be priced at a premium because Americans, not all Americans can afford to pay a premium on every product. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that would just have some limitations. Good point. Uh, Dana, you have your hand up? Hand up? Yes. Well, I wanted to ask your opinion. Um, I was thinking the other day about how the Montreal protocol back in the 80s when we banned chlorofluorocarbons, um, it worked and, you know, the ozone layer started healing. In your opinion, if we could address a specific compound or a, you know, something real specific that we could deal with like that Montreal protocol, do you have an opinion about what would be the first thing to go? The first thing, in my opinion, would be the PET of what we just, what I just showed you right? And it'll be the transition of using less of the crude oil. And of course, you know, the oil industry would kill me. I hate this is being recorded, but yes, use less of that so that you are transitioned to more of the plant-based, right? And so then other plastic would say, hey, we could also do this, right? It's not just PET because you have so many other plastics, you know, being used, but PET is used a lot, right? So that's, in my opinion, that, that would be where we should start. Yes. And I think it was Annette has her hand up. Yes. Um, yes. So uh, I read along the lines yesterday when I was reading the assigned readings that celluloid was used back mm -hmm. then and then it was replaced with other synthetic polymers. Could we bring back that method of like making celluloid for items like plastics and all? And what are like, is it is it harmful? Is it safer? Is it, you know, yeah. Um, as an academic, I would say yeah, uh, yes, right? Um, we should go back to using more of that. It has its advantages, and I think it's doable. And I'm going to show you a little bit of research why I think it's doable in the next few slides. And hopefully, if you still have questions, please chime in. And so I'm going to show you something with lignant. And so, yes, using cellulose-based materials is, is promising. And yes, we should go back to that. Um, one more hand. Heal? Yeah. So I think I kind of figured out what I wanted to ask, but as uh, corporations start moving, hopefully corporations start moving from non, uh, what is it, crude oil based plastics, what do you, and they like plant based plastics can become cheaper. Do you think hemp would be a good idea for replacing crude oil based, based plastics? Because I think they're more biodegradable. I think they biodegrade in like six months or something like that. And they grow pretty fast. And I just wanted to know your thoughts on hemp. Hemp is a good option. But remember how we talked about shelf life for certain materials? So more research would need to be done. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it does biodegrade faster. So what can we use it for? And what capacity? And what's the time frame? Do you think there is like research being research that can be put to making it have a longer shelf life? Oh, yes. And then, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, yep. 
that's all the hands. But I had a question in chat. How does Saudi Arabia decide to produce plant-based water bottles? Good question. I don't know. So um, that was one, like I said, I was looking for, for something for class, I think a couple of years ago and came across that. So you have to keep in, in mind, especially with um, your R&D and academia, we're always looking for different things to use, right? And then as we uh, provide more evidence, then you have industry that'll try it. They'll put it on the market and see how it works. So I don't think it was, you know, we're all trying our best to move away from plastic. So I'm sure some researchers kind of looked into it. And then once they got to the point and, you know, presented it to whatever industry, or, you know, that wanted to say, okay, we're going to try it in Saudi Arabia. That's how it probably kind of happened, right? So it's the same thing if I was producing a particular cellulose, like someone was mentioned before, and I collaborated with a company and say, hey, can we produce these bottles? And then you kind of just say, we have this patent, we want to put it out there, we're trying these bottles, we'll see the shelf life, we'll put water in it, we do all this test on it, and then you kind of transition that way. And again, the end goal is, will consumers actually use it? Because now that we've produced, it's, on a, it's a small demand, so we're not going to make as much money at first, right? But is it going to increase? Do they trust it? what, you know, is going to be widely used and so forth. And so then you kind of move forward. Hopefully, Rebecca, that answers your question. Okay. Well, I want to get to the next few slides and then we'll go. I think there's some more questions in the chat that I want to address. Okay. This, it, you know, I just wanted to show this figure. I'm not going to break it down. I know it looks like it's a, a lot. It says breaking the plastic wave in numbers. What I want to point out is that there are people that are working on it. They're trying to figure out where do we start? Do we start with dispose? Do we start at how much we use? What's the substitute, the design, reduce the microplastic? We didn't go into detail about the microplastic, but there are some references that I provided for you, how to reduce that and so forth. And you all have seen the recycle issue. And so there are, you know, we are looking into it. And so if you see that heading at the top of the slide is what I wanted you to take from this. Research finds plastic flows into the ocean expected to triple by 2040. That that's an issue because we already know it's affecting our aquatic life, okay? But immediate action could stem tide by more than 80%. The immediate action includes all of these flags that you see on this diagram, one through eight, right? And so if we take small steps on each of these flags, then we can reduce that so that we don't reach that flow into the ocean by 2040, okay? So we don't have that, that tripling, right? And we'll have some reductions. So just keep that in mind for what you're doing, what you're sharing with people, what people have put in the chat. So just keep that in mind. So the next thing is, the ethics of corporate social responsibility. What I wanted to point out here, um, and we've kind of touched on it a little bit throughout, is that what are the, the corporate's responsibility when they talk about their um, waste generation, their disposal processes, the chemicals that they use, and so forth. And so there's a, one of your resources, again, talks about trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, caring, and citizenship. And so I just want to pause on this just a second because I want to give you all some information about this. Give me one. Let me find my notes on this. Yes, there are two things I want to point out that this resource talked about. They said, okay, companies engage in CSR, the corporate social responsibility, when they confer benefits on the communities located in or near where they work, okay? So they confer about the benefits of the, the communities located near, say, their plants and so forth. As we know from what we've seen in the videos and the stories that have been shared, the studies that have been shared, this is not always priority where they consider the benefits of the communities. Because as we can see, some of these processes do not benefit the local communities. Someone did point out that they provide jobs, which is true. But is that worth um, the increase of incidence of cancer in that community? Okay, um, so by it's not required by law for the corporate to consider these things. 
when they're looking at their profit oriented operations. So it's not required by law that they consider that. But we're hoping and through their colleagues that because of ethics that they will, okay? Uh, so one example is consider a mining company which offers to build a road between its landing strip and neighboring community in order to boost local tourism or business. So that community takes that as a benefit because they're gonna build a road. But on the opposite side is that, um, do that does that community take into account the long-term effects of that mining company there? It's just something for you to think about when you're looking at these aspects. The other thing that I wanna point out from this study is the difference between motives and outcomes. Some people come, become very delusional when it comes to the corporate social responsibility, when they discover that the company, which has conferred about the benefit of the community, is doing so only to enhance its image. So when we talk about companies considering their emissions, their carbon footprint and so forth, they have these policies that they say, uh, like the, the videos pointed out, Park and Gamble want you, to, you know, want you to think that everything they do is recyclable and they're looking at sustainable uh, materials. But then these communities, we're the consumers, we're surprised that they're only doing that to enhance their image. Not necessarily putting things in place to do something different. It's only about the image. Does so anyone want to comment on that? Or do you believe it? I feel like it kind of goes, can you hear me all right? Yes. Um, I feel like it kind of goes with like the whole like consumer demand thing. Like if we demand that they, you know, become more eco-friendly and then they do that, it's like a benefit. Um, and while I don't think it's like an authentic, like, I don't know, message or like means of doing so. I feel like it's kind of like if the ends are better than the means kind of situation. Yes. Yep. I agree. Uh, another hand, Ivy. Is that Jonathan? Is that correct? Um, yeah. Uh -huh. I, th I think the problem with a lot of the things about like, oh, if we demand that they're more environmentally friendly is that it's oftentimes much cheaper for companies to pretend to be environmentally friendly and to like, post statistics about how well they're doing that don't actually reflect like positive impact. Yes. And so they're, yeah, they're motivated. Like the most profitable thing is not to actually be good. It's just to like do whatever they can to convince their consumers that they are. I agree. Uh, two more hands, Josephine. I think it's not surprising in, in situations like, you know, Procter and Gamble and companies like that they're trying to like develop a wholesome image some kind of like because I mean a lot of their products end up being for like families um so they try to like you know they try to set about some kind of wholesome image so being sustainable somehow like achieves that mm -hmm. um so yeah it, it can definitely like um be a factor in like ma making a company just look good and it's not necessarily their um it's not necessarily their, you know, moral intentions. Right, exactly. It goes back to our bioethics. What's going to be our guiding, um, our guiding principles? Yes. Dana? Uh, well, this reminds me of something we talked about in our ethical supply chain conversation yesterday. And I learned a concept, maybe everybody else knew it, um, the blockchain this was a very new concept to me, but it, this, he, um, our professor mentioned it as a way for the consumer to engage in holding corporations accountable for what they say they're doing. Do you see that being used in uh, this capacity? I don't see it being used yet. And I think it should be used. Okay. Um, or maybe it's not used enough because we don't see, like I said, they have the, 
the website has it on there that we're considering this even and I guess I'm a Nike consumer so you know you see some of their shoes now sustainable material right and that's all good I'm, I'm glad I can buy a shoe right but it, it talks about what your colleague was saying before but what else is it changing um, you have these certain shoes that are sustainable but this may be five out of five thousand so what's your plan? And I haven't gone to their website. I have to admit, I haven't gone to their website to look at their plan, but hopefully they have a long-term plan that that increases, right, over time. Yep. Is there anything else? I thought I saw another hand. The chain is too limited, yes. Okay, there are some other things in the chat that I will come back to. I wanna get through a few more slides and we can discuss that during the seminar time if you all don't mind. Okay, so I'm going to skip this next slide, and I just want to give you all more of a, it's really a small picture, but I think it has great potential of using renewable resources um, for materials that we use, and you can kind of see this coming um, in the immediate, and so you all were talking about the time frame, is it possible, and so hopefully this will give you um, an idea that it is possible, right? Um, and so if you look at this slide, it talks about renewable resources. This is um, some research that's been done by a few of my colleagues at Delaware. And so, as I mentioned before, most of my research, we are switching to green solvents and I'm not gonna share that today. I think this is more um, uh, prevalent and you all can relate to it when it comes to plastics, okay? so. Lignocellulose is the most abundant form of biomass on earth. And so this hopefully answers the question one of your colleagues was talking about how this may compete with the crops or the land that's available. So this is a biomass that's already available, okay? Um, it's versatile for chemicals, polymers, and fuels, and so forth. And it can reduce toxicity over petroleum-derived counterparts, which has been a bulk of what we've been talking about. And so if you look at this uh, figure here, you see it has the tree, you have this lignin, you have cellulose, and you have hemicellulose. And so what the point of their goal is to take this, process it, and now you have these products that you don't have to use your petroleum-derived counterparts, okay? And so using this is addressing the challenges with bio-based materials. So we have the feedstock abundance, they're looking at chemistry, they're looking at the chemical toxicity properties. And like I mentioned before, they looked at the cost analysis, how effective this is. And, and what they're saying is that it is promising when it comes to cost. Again, now it's small scale and hopefully they can get to the large scale if more people buy into it, okay? And so they're addressing these issues with bio-based block polymers. And I'll give you a little bit of detail of block polymers. I won't go into like the hard science of it, just giving you the big picture of what they're doing, okay? So the overview of this, if I have these block polymers, and so you see this beads, they're different colors. So these are gonna represent your different polymers that you're putting together, right? And that's what we talk about block polymers, okay? So we have sustainable, low-cost feedstocks. We just talked about biomass. These are tunable. And so it has this TG here. Some of my STEM majors, and know we're talking about glass transition at constant thermal stability. So basically what I wanna point out is that they're characterizing these materials and they know they can tune them to what they want. Basically they can customize them, right? They also have predictable polymerization behavior and properties. What that means is that they can take um, simulations or software and look at how if I polymerize, and that means that if I put these chains together, if I put one of these compounds of one of these polymers together, when they polymerize, I can use this software to predict how they're going to behave and what their properties are going to be. Right, And so materials technologies, we put all this together when it comes to structure, property, and performance. Right, I need for it to have a certain property so that it performs in this particular application. And once you have this software, then you have a versatile library of your bio-based monomers for block polymers. So the key here is that I can start with these monomers. And yes, they've tested a few materials and applications, but if I have this library, then others can take these monomers and basically design, optimize for other materials and applications. Hopefully you catch that because we wanna make sure that it's not limited, 
to only a few things because remember we said at the beginning of this lecture so many things are made you know so many things are plastic right but if we can switch this to more sustainable resources then it'll be good okay now not too much chemistry but i want to point out so we have structure property relationships in the bio-based polymers so if you look at this picture it's talking about basically from the tree to a, uh, a bottle so it, it includes some compounds you're going to extract it and then you're able to make this bottle so just like we talked about in saudi arabia they have the 100 percent plant-based we have people over here that's trying to get to the same thing. It's not on market yet, but they're working on it. And so in this right, uh, the, you see these red and blue circles here, we look at the microstructure. So remember how one of your colleagues says, hey, they figured out it does not hold the liquid. It does not hold the water. Well, for us to figure out whether it's going to hold it, we have to look at the microstructure. So this is a micro image of what this would look like and how we can change it into this polymer to produce this bottle. And so what you're looking at here on the right is if I take these different monomers and put them together, what type of properties will I get? And so here's just showing, hey, if I take this pink, blue, purple, and green and put it together, then I increase the glass transition, which I need for certain properties and materials. And then I can tune that where I can switch it around, change the order, um, change some side chains here, modify it, and tune it to what I need it to be. And then this reference is showing that this particular process has been patented. So uh, I won't go into that a little bit. What I do want to show here is the predicted thermal properties of this switchgrass composition. And I don't know if some of you have heard of switchgrass, switch but you can look it up again. We're looking at um, crops or plants that are not competing with the crops that are eligible for food, right? And so what it's showing is that this particular switchgrass is made of these compounds, these particular chemicals listed here. And so this particular research used these compounds so they can, again, modify, tune, where can I add side chains, make these into usable materials. And by using this, then they can predict the thermal properties by using what I told you before, software right, using simulations, and then they can say, okay, if you have switch grass and you have these compositions, this is what you can switch around. So instead of having A, B, and C, you can add an X to that and switch around and, and change your blocks so your in application can be different, and we can tell you what the thermal properties would be of that material. Okay, um, again, the thermal properties are dependent on the feedstock, which is the biomass that I mentioned before, and the functionalization. The functionalization is what we change those side groups to or if we're putting um, the different blocks in a certain order and adding side groups to um, say the phenols and not the syringols. Okay, so that's what we mean by functionalization. All right, so lastly, this particular um, paper um, and if you see it at the bottom here, so we'll start at the top. It says pressure sensitive adhesives, PSAs, directly from biomass, real lignin. So the bioness that I mentioned before, they were able to get this biomass. And this is something that um, industry is waste for them. So this particular startup company took their biomass and say, hey, we're going to put this and make it of good use. So they took that lignin, um, they deep depolymerize uh, the biomass, they functionalize. So you can see now this aromatic ring has a different functional group on it. Then they create a block polymer, which we, which you know is now, right? They create a different um, order. So instead of, you know, they have the pink, blue, and green. And so now they have a block polymer and now they can polymerize it to something useful. So they created tape from this lignin. So now they have what the title of this particular paper was, From Tree to Tape. So it's a direct synthesis of your pressure-sensitive adhesives from depolymerized raw lignocellulosic biomass to produce this tape. Yes, I thought it was creative, too. Um, we have a, a hand, Annette. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Yeah, you're pronouncing it right. Okay. Um, so after what you explained, I thought this was really cool. Um, like, how can we like dispose of it like chemically, like how can we recycle this method or like whenever we use items, make plas 
plastic items out of this? How can we just like dissolve it or something like that? I'm just curious to know how we can break it out, like break it molecular, no molecular right. level. Kimmy rules. So most of your um, plant base is going to be biodegradable. Mm -hmm. So a certain period of time, they're just going to break down. Um, so depending on how the functional groups, though, um, you can do it where you can. Um, what do you call it? So like if I create a polymer in a lab and say I cross link it, I could change that cross linking process to the point where I'll know how much heat is needed to recycle it. Does that make sense? So then yeah. I'm functionalizing it, but then I know what I need to do to actually break it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's what they're doing as well. But most of what they're starting with is also biodegradable. So they won't have to worry about it to a certain extent, depending on what they're functionalizing in their polymerization process. Does that make sense in it? Yes, it okay. does. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Now, so um, this kind of adds on to what I was just mentioning to you, um, Annette. So when you look at these linkages and it's showing here, say I have this um, lignocellulose biomass, I can cleave it, I can substitute the phenol, I can functionalize with different side groups, I can produce chemicals and materials, and because I'm because they're making it um, and they know their process, then they can think about how they can possibly break it down as well, okay? And they test it along the way. And again, that's why it's important for them to develop that library because then someone else can say, well, hey, I can take those compounds, I can take those different uh, functional groups and then produce something else, okay? And that your hands up again? Yeah, uh, I just wanna get used to like the terminology of this, like what does hemicellulose and ligno, I believe, lignocellulosic mean? Because I know the word cellulose, I know it comes from plants, uh, but I just wanna know like the, the these words. Okay, so when you have your, basically your hemicellulose is not pure, like you're gonna have something else along with it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you basically functionalized it. Um, your solid cellulose. So in this particular case, they have a mixture of your solid cellulose and your he uh, hemicellulose. Okay. Your cellulose is basically um, your sugar from this lignin. Right. And so yes. this particular. OK, so you got that part. OK. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so when you have other cellulose, you may have like cellulose acetate. Right. So now they've added a uh, acetate group to it. OK. All right. Dana. I have so much respect for your understanding of the chemistry here. Um, this may be obvious, but I just want to clarify, this is just chemistry, right? This is not bioengineering or genetics. This is just chemistry. Is that accurate? It is accurate, but chemistry is everywhere. <laughs> so I also talk here. So what I want to say, it is just chemistry, but you have some of these um, compounds or functional groups in use, so it can be associated with bioengineering. But this particular case, yes, it is just chemistry, but we can relate it to some bio, and that's why you have biochemistry. Yes. Got it. And is um, gen bio, <laughs> I don't even know the terminology for it all, but the gene editing, is, is that also being used in these like alternate Plastic this is not what you can. So uh -huh. what you're referring to, if I took this, you see this, this tree, this tree is already here. We're taking it as is. If I did bioengineer or genetic, that means that I'm going to genetically modify a tree, then grow it. And we do that. Say we wanted to take a material and um, make it, I'll use bacteria, for instance, make it produce more ethanol, we would genetically modify it. So we would take its DNA, change it so that it produces more of one particular product. That would be engineering. Or if I take this plant, I genetically modify it, then I grow it, then I'm getting something else, right? Yes. Okay. And that your hands up again, or you want me to keep going? Yeah, uh, I'm just okay. very curious about this. So I'm not really big into like the hard chemistry i know just like the fundamental concepts of it but i was wondering what thermal properties or is that what you mentioned thermal i did properties are? yes does that so, does that like is that associated with like like i know thermal means like like heat and energy and all that does that lead to like how they how much energy or heat can they withstand like can they like 
the molecules with stain or, or something like that like i don't know my yeah. technology yes yeah. so when we talk about um glass transition this is a little harder science but remember how we talk about polymers and i mentioned glass transition so when you have yes. polymers you have somewhat of a chain right mm -hmm. and so they may be organized in a certain order and depending on what the temperature is that particular chains when they're together they may relax and okay. then when they relax the properties of that material itself may soften or get stronger depending on its thermal properties so would that also be like a risk for if you're using products made out of this it, there ha they have to be in a certain temperature or something like room temperature or that yes you have to take that into account when you're designing the material okay yes Thank you. so any modifications we have to know how it responds to the environment right to a certain mm -hmm. environment to know how it's going to behave in its application okay does that make sense so if yes. i was making so like in class we talk about say your uh the mirror on your car if that mm -hmm. car is going to be in sub-zero below zero weather we right. need polymers that can withstand that temperature that means that they're not going to become brittle and just break off mm -hmm. okay yeah okay um hold on one second notion um click and clack are we okay to continue into the seminar area hour to kind of answer questions i only have like a few more slides or you want me to stop them for a break? What do we oh, want to do? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and then we'll take our usual 15 minute break. This has been great. Go. So keep going. going. Okay. All right. So I saw another hand. It went down. Yes. No sheen. No sheen. Go ahead. All right. I didn't want to interrupt because I know the hand like shows up on the screen. Um, anyway, so I, I was looking into this and um Obviously, I don't fully understand a lot of the chemistry, but I have taken through like elements of biochemistry, which is like one of the lower level biochem courses. Um, and I was just wondering, um, I've heard about like lignocellulosic like biomasses, um, or I was reading about this, um, and how they can potentially be used um, for jet fuel, which I thought was really fascinating. I was wondering if you've heard about that. And um, if you have, if you could speak more on it, and if you haven't, then if there is um, any ideas of like, I don't know, just weird combinations <laughs> that this could be used for, I guess. Right. So I haven't, I have not. But what I can say from my knowledge is basically what you have a biofuel. You've heard of those, right? Yes. It's the same thing. So you right. have this uh, material that can produce some type of oil, right? And so that's what they're using it for. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I yes, guess I just yes. never considered all of the different like applications that this could have. Yes. So it's the same. Yeah. So same thing, same, a different application, but yes, it can be used for that. Um, it's the same way, you know, we think of like bacteria being able to produce a certain material for fuel, like ethanol and so forth. So yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. So your colleague mentioned the thermal properties. Um, there are other characteristics and properties that has to be done, right, um, to make sure that this particular material um, can be compared to what's already on the market. And so some of the things that we do um, for materials in my lab, you may look at the tensile strength, how much stress and load it can handle, um, how much it can be stretched before it, it breaks and so forth. So they had to do a peel test and they did it at a, a certain temperature. So they're just showing their apparatus and they're showing their peel force compared to scotch and your Fisher brand labeling tape. And Fisher brand is what we use in the lab. So you would expect it to have, you know, a, a peel force higher than the others, but it's just letting you know that this particular plant-based tape is comparable to what is already on the market, which I think is good and very cool. And again, it's just showing evidence on where we're moving when it comes to more sustainable or renewable resources. Now, lastly, and I actually, um, I'm not gonna go in, really, I wanted to show this one just to show the, the cute little picture here that they decided to show the 3D printing with real bio oil and so forth. You see that and because people are fascinated with um, 
3D printing and so forth. But it also shows you, again, how you can take the lignin, depolymerize it, um, certain temperatures showing you the chemistry of it, break it down, and then it has this word acrylation. And so they're doing something to it, functionalization, like I mentioned before, and then they're able to print. And so, again, there are people that are working on these things. Things are promising to use renewable resources. Like some of your colleagues say, we won't get there all at once, but there are steps that are being made um, for us to move forward. Again, this is a, a small startup company. There are companies that have contacted them and say, hey, can you send me these particular compounds in bulk? They're not there yet, but I'm hopeful that they'll get there. And so this is definitely a good start. So through all of that, we got through it. I know there's some other questions in the chat, but actually my next slide was question. And I do have some other slides on lignin if there are more questions about the chemistry and so forth. But I do want to stop at this time to address any questions. And then if we need to take a break, then we can because we're at 1145. Oh, I see a, a couple of hands. So I think I saw Annette's hand first. Yeah, um, I'm just very curious about this, like especially like at, like the chemistry of it. Do you know any sources that I could read that I could just like for my free time just read about like how you guys do this and how you guys are studying it and how you guys can manipulate like manipulate the molecular part of plastics and such? So that's two part of your question. So this part, um, I can put these like references in the chat. These okay. are going to talk more about the chemistry and the polymerization, right? Okay. And yeah. but it may not give you as much information that you want on the plastic side. And so let me look at some other resources that may you you know that you may want to use when it comes to plastic. Because these are, you know, this is 2017, 2018. They're a little older. So there may be some newer ones that speak to what's out there now when it comes to using um, you know, the bioplastics or producing them. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ethan. Hi. Yeah. So I um, am a biochem major and I just took biochem two, where we talked about a lot about metabolism. Um, and so I'm just wondering, is there a way to use um, metabolic pathways that already exist to aid in the degradation of plastics? Like I'm looking at um, all the pictures of these um, plastics and it looks like if you break them into monomers, you have things with um, aromatic rings in them, which remind me of kind of how um, amino acids look. So I'm wondering if there's any way to modify these monomers um, so that they could become amino acids and then just flow naturally into the metabolic pathways that already exist in organisms. Of course, Ethan, biochemists can do that. So basically what you're asking, so when we talk about break them down your metabolic pathways, um, what you probably remember from your biochemistry is that you have enzymes that can cleave at different sites, right? So what you could do is create sites where they can be cleaved by something, right? And so then if there is a pathway that you're trying to mimic, you could possibly do that. It may not be straightforward. It may not be like short term, but you definitely could try. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, and then yeah. Um, I just had a, another thought, which is, could we sort of use these plastics as carbon sources to maybe synthesize other useful um, biotechnology? Yes. Okay, what, um, what kinds of things could we make? For, uh, besides like tape and stuff like that? Um... Yeah. Let me see, there is, um, I could see with these aromatic rings, we use something similar. I don't think it's polyvinyl alcohol, but it's another polymer that we use for like drug delivery. I could see that. Um, if the materials, like it's showing this um, here on this microstructure, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's porous, but if there's porous materials that we can functionalize where they can expand, then you can use them in the body where uh, we're looking at like, um, artificial organs and so forth. So on the bio side. So I think it's definitely possible. Again, you just got to look at those properties that are um, necessary in the biological environment, like swelling, hold on to liquid, allowing gases and fluids to pass through. So you want to be have a certain amount of porosity and so forth. So yes, I think it, it would be possible. 
Awesome. And then just, I have one more question. How do you go from, um, or how, how does a scientist go about like imagining what, um, like a potential thing that you could make with plastics, you know, like it, it's one thing to already have the procedure and to just do it, but how do you go about designing that procedure and thinking of the possibilities? Uh, there's two ways. Uh, one is it's probably multiple ways, but a lot of times we look at a problem and then try to figure out a solution, right? And so if we know that the chemistry is available, then we address it that way. Does that make sense? So we have this problem, say it's, um, again, say it's drug delivery, right? And we need something that would swell and create pores. And then we look at what type of polymers are available, what chemistry is necessary, and then we work backwards. Okay, that, that yes. kind of makes sense. Yeah, then the other way is to look at this compound. Like I was telling you, they're creating, yeah, I don't know if you see my cursor, but you have this compound and you say, okay, um, what can this compound be used with or what can it be functionalized with? That's why I think the library is going to be key. And I don't know how far they on it. There are on it. But when they have a particular library and they have the particular compounds and they have their thermal properties, you can say, hey, we have these, say, five different compounds. They have these particular characterizations. Let's test them for this specific application. And then from there, you kind of create questions and then answer them. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, click and clap back at you. That was brilliant, Professor Keaton Thompson. Thanks, click and clap.